Hey guys, welcome back to or welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Chyan Olchen. And if you have, thank you so much for watching my videos and supporting me. You guys have no idea how much it means to me. You're really making my dreams come true and I can't thank you guys enough for it. Before we get any further into anything, yes, I dyed my hair yesterday with the help of my mum. And yes, mum did my makeup as well because... I'm useless and I can't do makeup even though I'm 18. So just getting that out there now. So in today's video I am doing another instalment to my series True Crimes of Australia. If you guys haven't been here before or haven't been here in a while I have started a new series. Well not technically new anymore but it is True Crimes of Australia. And in this series, I do cover Australian true crime cases and Australian missing person cases. And this is the first missing person case I am covering in this series. And today we are looking at the infamous case of missing Australian child William Terrell. Tyrell, I'm pretty sure it's Terrell. And if you live in Australia, chances are you have probably heard the name William Terrell once or twice before. I remember hearing a lot about it when it first happened in 2014. I also know that a while back, um, when I say a while I mean anywhere from a year to three years ago, a American true crime user Kendall Ray did post a video about this case. I will have this video linked down below and if you have been here for a while you probably already know that I absolutely love Kendall Ray. I love her content and honestly I would love to meet her one day and talk to her. I think that'd be so cool. And yeah, so this video will be linked down below as well so you can check that out as well. As per usual, I will have all of my sources linked down below including Kendall's video like I mentioned. And I will also have the book that I bought when I decided to do this case linked down below as well. So if you guys want to check it out, you can. The book that I used to help me heavily research this case is Missing William Terrell by Caroline Overington. She is an amazing writer and such an interesting person. Not only is she an author, she was also an investigative journalist, former foreign correspondent, and she has written numerous books such as Last Woman Hanged and Kickback, The AWB Scandal and I'm really interested in reading those books as well and she has won numerous awards over the past decade more for her work. She has won the Blake Dawson Prize and has also won a Keith, the Keith Murdoch Award for Excellence in Journalism. Caroline is also another person that I would really love to meet one day and talk to and with this massive snippet of information out of the way Let's get more into the case of William Terrell and his disappearance. William Terrell went missing on the 12th of September 2014 and at the time of his disappearance he was actually at his foster grandma's place in a village in New South Wales called Kendall which is an extremely pretty area. It's known as the Poets Village. It was named after the famous poet as well. And Aside from being a very pretty area, it is also a very bushy bushland area and most of the houses in Kendall do back onto some sort of bushland. Now I just want to say that throughout this video I will be showing photos of William a couple of times because um, his name and face need to stay out there as much as possible and honestly one of the best things anyone can possibly do for any missing person case is to share that person's name, their face and details about the disappearance and about them. And social media in recent years has proved that it can play a really big part into helping find missing persons and to solve their cases. As I was saying, William Terrell went missing on the 12th of September 2014 and he was only three when he went missing and as of now he had been missing for six years and just over three months. William went missing from his foster grandma's place at 48 Benaroon Drive in Kendall 
and he would be around nine now. He was born on the 26th of June 2011. At the time of his disappearance, William had dark brown, light blonde hair and big brown eyes. And when he went missing, he was wearing a Spider-Man suit and this particular Spider-Man suit was a two-piece set and was said to be fire engine red. Because of the fact that what he was wearing was bright, bright red, fire engine red, it means that it should have been extremely easy to see him and spot him. However, when he missing, no one heard or saw a thing, not even a scream from William. The day that William went missing was actually a really normal day for the family and no one had even an inkling, a feeling or a suspicion that something bad was going to happen that day. Um, William woke up early that day and it was pretty cold out. In fact, it was six degrees out that day and he asked his foster father if he could watch Fireman Sam and the answer was yes. Because it was fairly cold out that day, by fairly I mean pretty damn cold outside, William was drugged up in his PJs and pull-ups and because he was still really young, like of course he's just sitting up and watching Fireman Sam on an iPhone and he loved being at his foster grandma's house because they were covered full of toys and so he went and pulled those out because he's three, he still loved playing with his toys and he pulled all his toys out, played with them for a little while before getting changed into the infamous Spider-Man suit and having breakfast with his family. When William had gone missing, he was actually playing in his foster grandma's backyard with his older sister who was around four years old at the time and this sister was given the name of Lindsay. By the way, this is not her real name. It was the name given to her by the children's court to protect her real identity and to protect her privacy. They didn't live in Kendall. William, Lindsay and the foster parents, that is, only the foster grandparents did. At that point, only William foster grandma did because sadly um, his opa, the foster grandfather, had passed away. For some people might even be asking what was William even doing in Kendall if he didn't live there and the answer to that is the entire family decided to visit their foster grandmother um, because as I mentioned sadly William's foster mom dad had passed away and so because of this, the foster grandma was actually looking to sell up the place in Kendall because she was getting older and the place just required too much maintenance for a recently widowed elderly woman. And so they all decided to go up and visit that house one last time and just enjoy being there for the last time, get some more memories and share the old one. And Lindsay and William had visited this house quite a lot of time between the years of 2012 and 2014 and they absolutely loved it there. As I have already mentioned a couple of times, um, William was in the care of his foster parents at the time of his disappearance and they all lived in Sydney North, William, Lindsay and the foster parents. And he had actually been with the foster parents since he was about nine months old. There is actually a law in New South Wales which makes it illegal for the biological parents and foster parents to come forward and reveal themselves. And this is really to protect Lindsay's um, real identity and to protect her privacy. And this is a law with all foster parents in New South Wales. They are not allowed to give up their identities and neither are the biological parents um, without permission. This is to protect foster children's identities and other identities as well and to keep them safe. But because this was kept a secret from the public, the fact that these were his foster parents and that he was a foster child, the public began to grow a lot of um, rumours, suspicions and they were really starting to speculate 
And the Foster Parents really did want to come forward and reveal themselves to shut down these rumours and speculation, but legally they couldn't. The legal consequence for them would have been jail time. The thing is, as many people would know, being a foster parent is very different to being a biological parent. Um, in the sense that in the state of New South Wales, foster parents can't just up and go wherever they want with their foster children. They actually need permission from DOC, which is Department of Community Services, or as it is known now, FACS, which stands for Family and Community Services. And really they need permission from these and for different foster families it varies between what distance they can travel without needing permission. Some families can't travel beyond 500 kilometers or 100 kilometers and others can't travel interstate or overseas. In this respect, William's foster parents were the perfect people for this. They were really on top of stuff like this. They would always get the proper permission they needed to do anything and they really did everything they could, should and needed to for William and Lindsay. The family had been overseas to Bali and they had permission of course and they had managed to secure what is called a bulk approval. And what this is, is basically in Australian schools, you know how you go on field trips and stuff um, you have to sign a permission slip. It was basically a bulk amount of those. Because the family had been travelling a lot between their home and Kendall, as sadly, as I mentioned, William's foster grandfather had gotten very sick. Then they found out his time was very limited, and then of course after that there was the funeral. So it made sense for them to have this so that they could go and travel as much as they need to if he suddenly took a really bad turn for the worst and they needed to be there as soon as possible. Another thing to note is that this um, amount of bulk approval was still valid for the month of September in 2014. When the family finally got the news that William Foster Grandfather's gravestone had been installed, they were having some problems with it before, there were some delays and it finally got installed. They decided that it, they should go up and visit and see it for themselves and so they had decided to go on the 12th of September 2014 but on the day before, on the third day, one of William Foster Father's meetings was cancelled and they decided to leave a bit earlier and get a head start on things. They officially left for Kendall at 4pm on the 11th of September 2014. Just before William Terrell went missing, he was playing on the back deck of his foster nana's house and his foster nana and his foster mom were watching him and he was playing a game where he was roaring like a tiger and they named the game Daddy Tiger and he actually did ask Lindsay if she wanted to play with him as well but she was really focused on her drawing, she was making a card for their foster grandfather's grave when they visited it later. At about 10.30am, William jumped from the deck and ran around to the side of the house. They could all still hear him roaring, so he, they just thought, oh, he'll be around there for a couple seconds, then he'll come back around to us. At the time, William's foster mum was talking to their nana, and after a couple of minutes she noticed that it was really quiet, she couldn't hear him anymore and she went, oh this is really quiet and strange, I'm going to go look for him. Unfortunately when she walked around inside of the house she could not see him. She started calling out his name trying to find him and he didn't like pop out from anywhere and surprise her, he was just gone. And she freaked out because this is a foster child, it's way worse when it's a foster child, but also it is still a child going missing. And at first, the foster nana was like, oh, let's not worry too much, maybe he's just playing, maybe he's just hiding, he'll pop out. But sadly, he just didn't. And like I mentioned, he was wearing a fire engine red vitamin suit, so he really should have stuck out like a stork 
thumb. It's spring, it's September, everything's green, the red should have stuck out against everything and it there was nothing there. William wasn't there and his foster mum freaked out and quickly searched the property and found him nowhere. And then she went and asked other residents who were outside if they had seen a little boy in a fire engine bed by the main street and no one had seen him and finally enough no one had seen anything suspicious that morning or had even heard anything at the time of his disappearance. William's foster mum did say to one woman while they were searching for William that she really believed that William had been taken and of course this other woman didn't take it very seriously. She was like, oh, it's just a mother being frantic trying to find their child and she even offered up the suggestion after offering to help that maybe he had wandered off to a nearby bus stop which did have an animal mural painted on it and it might have caught his attention. William's foster mum did say that while searching she did hear a scream that didn't sound like a normal scream, it sounded like a high pitched scream like a child had just hurt themselves. So she frantically ran towards where the scream had come from and searched the entire area and sadly she found no one and nothing and after a while she even really started questioning herself and asked if she had really heard the scream and maybe it had been a bird screeching but then she kicked herself and was like no I heard this scream. After a while of doing a bit of a search around the nearby surrounding areas um, she did not find William and she called triple zero at 10.47am and told the um, operator that her three and a half year old son was missing, that he has asthma, um, not very severe asthma but enough that he needs a puff occasionally and that she had not seen him. They found out that the call wasn't made from William's foster mum's phone but rather her mum's handset mainly because of the really patchy um, phone reception Kendall does have. For this part I will be actually reading off my screen to because I am relaying the conversation between William's foster mother and the triple zero operator. The triple zero operator asked how long William had been missing for and she said well I think we've been looking for him for about 15 to 20 minutes now. I thought it could be fine, it could be longer. Because he was playing just around here, we heard him and then we heard nothing. William foster mum described him to the operator as two and a half feet tall wearing a Spider-Man suit with short dark sand coloured hair and big browny green coloured eyes. She also said that he had a freckle on the top of his head where his, when his hair is parted to the left. At first, the majority of people, including police, did believe that William had just wandered off and was lost in the bush, which is not uncommon. It happens all the time. Children wander off, they get lost in the bush, in the forest, in woods, and they were just like, yep, he's just out there, we'll do a search and we should find him. And no one would really, I mean, people were thinking that it might have been an abduction, but most people were thinking he was lost at Bush. Sadly, with all the searching they did, they did not find him. Police and the general public, so many volunteers did spend many days trying to find William. They searched high and low for him. And every time they searched a new area, they were just hoping that they would hear a little boy crying, crying for help, struggling, uh, or that they would just see him sitting down somewhere waiting to be rescued, and sadly, this didn't happen either. 
no one wanted to think about the possibility that William had been taken, had been abducted, especially the police, but after a couple of days they had to seriously start considering that possibility. And a lot of people like to say that um, that sort of stuff just does not happen here in Australia. Kids don't just get snapped midday, mid-morning. It just doesn't happen here. It happens other countries like America, which sadly isn't true. It happens everywhere in the world. No country is free from that. And it has happened numerous times before in Australia. And this is honestly part of why I wanted to cover Australian missing person cases because quite a few of them had ended up like this and yeah it's just I understand why a lot of people wouldn't think it happens here but at the same time it's very frustrating because it happens everywhere. At first when people really started to start believing that something more than William walking off and getting lost happened, they really started to think that the foster family or the biological family had something to do with the disappearance of William. However, both groups of people were ruled out as suspects after they had both been investigated. People really did start to believe that something more had happened to William when a man named Ronald Chapman came forward and described two cars that had been speeding down the road. This man lived in the area um, and he described them speeding down the road, driving erratically at around the time of William's disappearance. However, he did not know that at the time when this happened. He heard noise outside and actually went outside thinking that maybe the postman was early when he normally isn't. And when he stepped out, he noticed these two cars driving erratically. And the first car he saw, um, he described as being a Fawn Box C um, type four-wheel drive car with a female driver between the ages of late 20 to late 30, blonde hair and a short sleeve white blouse. He also said he was shocked that when he looked at the back seat, he found a little boy, practically a toddler, standing around in the back seat, unrestrained, and he had his hands on the glass windows. And he said one very interesting detail when mentioning the boy, that he was a very small child and wearing a fire engine red vitamin suit. Ronald Chapman had to take him one more step towards getting off his front veranda and he when he saw his second car and he described it as an iridescent blue car with a male driver and he said that because both of these cars were speeding, driving erratically and they were so close to each other that he should assume that the two cars were together. But that was not the only strange thing that had happened with cards on the morning of William's disappearance. In fact, William's foster mother said that when she opened the blinds in the kitchen that morning, she, well, not necessarily, might be getting that wrong, don't think it's the kitchen, might have been another room, but she was opening the blinds and she looked across the road and she saw two cars parked extremely close together. Um, which was weird because, you know, there's a lot of room there, it's a country area, the blocks are big, long driveways, and so they weren't even really parked close to any houses, they were more just driveway here, driveway here, cars right in the middle, and so she thought that was strange because, like, driveways are really long, normally people can fit, like, five cars on them, if you've been in New South Wales, you know. But she didn't find it too alarming, although she did note that both cars had windows down. But she wasn't too alarmed and just went about her morning. Then again, something weird happened with cars a bit later on with the family that day. And it was when William and Lindsay were showing their foster nana their new bike that they had just gotten. 
and they were kind of like riding at the front of the place with the foster mum and the nana watching them, they were showing off and were really just having a great time until I'm pretty sure it was Lindsay asked whose car is that and when um, the foster mum looked up she had seen a car drive past and then pull into the next door neighbour's driveway like to dip in and then straight back out and come out like they were doing a straight point turn. She didn't think too much of it until the driver kind of looked at her and gave her almost a defiant look that was mixed with a what are you looking at me for type look. Again, she just thought uh, maybe they just realised that bit of trail at the end of the road actually leads to the old Kendall Cemetery and that they would need a four wheel drive to get up there so they just turned around and came back down. Um, she did describe this car as being a dark green slash grey sedan and she didn't think much of it, she didn't get any other details because she had only seen the car for like five seconds. When police finally started looking more into the possibility of this being an abduction, they managed to come up with a list of a couple of suspects and I won't go into too much detail about the suspect, I won't give out every single bit of information on them if possible because if I do the video will end up being literally three hours long. If I ever do a podcast I will definitely cover this case and add in every single bit of detail that I can but for now I will just be including the suspect or persons of interest name the general info about them and why they were deemed persons of interest or suspects for a period of time. The first suspect is William Harry Spedding who everyone including himself called Bill and at the time um, Bill Spedding was a white good repairman like washing machines, dryers, that type of stuff, fridges and at the time of William Terrell's disappearance, he was living in a rented property or home in the village of Bonnie Hill. There are a few reasons why Bill was named a person of interest or a suspect pretty early on. And one of them is because where Bonnie Hills is, is actually about 20 minutes away from Kendall. And another reason or another thing to add on to it is the fact that Bill Spedding had actually come over to William Foster Nana's house and were working on the, her washing machine which wasn't filling up and the touchpad had been kind of messed with well just wasn't working so he wasn't able to repair it that day he had to wait for some parts to come in so he could properly repair it and William Foster mum thought it was a bit ridiculous how long her mum had been waiting to get this washing machine fixed. So on the morning of the 12th, William Foster mum actually called Mr. Bedding and asked when he would actually be able to fix this washing machine. Another reason why Bill Bedding was named or labelled as a person of interest is because Bill Bedding had actually been accused of sexually assaulting two young girls in the 1980s. However, he claimed that this just is not true and it was a result of a nasty split from his ex-wife. When police looked into this further, they actually found that there were no charges pressed and that throughout the entire thing and even now he still claims that he is innocent of um, those allegations and another reason why they kind of thought that maybe he was the person of interest or the man who was responsible is because his neighbour Dean, Dean Pollard um, actually always felt that there was something off with Bill and he made sure that his kids knew to stay away from him and to not go inside his house. He was fine with his kids and the boys living with um, Bill playing as long as he could see them. And another pretty damning thing was on the day of William's disappearance, Dean actually said that he had seen 
Bill driving his, wor his white work van, beating and driving erratically near the Goat Road, which is what is the nickname for the Houston Mitchell Drive. Police also believe that Bill Bedding was involved because at the time, um, he and his wife had three boys living with them that they honestly thought of as their own son. And he was supposedly at an assembly that day at the school. And they were there because the, one of these boys was receiving an award from the principal and they were really proud and they really wanted to go for him and he wanted them there. However, no one could actually confirm that Bill had been at that assembly at all. No one had seen him and no one could confirm it. Another suspect in this case is Bill Bedding's wife, Margaret Bedding. And police were thinking that she, not at first was a person of interest, but were thinking that maybe she was covering for Bill. And then they started actually seeing her as a possible suspect or person of interest. And a lot of people started saying that it could not have been her because her health at the time was really bad. She wasn't getting around all that well. And she was having really bad problems with her knee. She was waiting for a knee operation. And she was using railings as much as possible to be able to walk and was walking really slowly. And she described her pain and her knee herself as being bone on bone, which is incredibly painful. And when police interviewed her again sometime later and got her to do a walkthrough of her and her husband day on the day of William's disappearance, um, she was still actually really struggling to get around. She had only just had her knee surgery not long before that day. Police did briefly consider a former Tasmanian um, priest to be a person of interest and the reason why they were thinking it might have been him, um, by the way his name is Derek Andrew Nichols, and it's because in 1987 he was um, convicted of indecently assaulting a 12 year old boy and he was also on the child protection register in New South Wales and he had been found guilty 20 years later after the conviction of possessing child pornography. Nichols was in his 70s at the time of William's disappearance and lived in Kendall a short walk away from where William was last seen. However, police were able to rule him out as a suspect really quickly because he was elsewhere at the time of the disappearance. Another suspect at the time was Paul John Bickford, who was actually a really widely admired man and he was just seen as an outstanding elderly person. That was until he was convicted of sexually assaulting a 11-year-old um, girl in 2014 and this girl had Asperger's syndrome as well. The next person of interest is Anthony Jones and he had been he had served a three year prison sentence for the aggravated um, sexual assault of a 11 year old girl and at the time of William's disappearance he was a really heavy drinker and so he came home that afternoon really drunk and his ex-wife Debbie had kicked him out of the house and it is said that he collected scrap metal and sold it as a means to pay for his next drink. Um, because his ex-wife's car matched descriptions of cars that had been seen in the street of Benaroon Drive the day of the disappearance, they took her car for forensic testing and the testing came back and basically showed up no evidence of anything to do with William or the crime or the The next person of interest is Frank Abbott and he was serving prison time for a string of assaults on young boys and 
He had been in trouble with the law many times throughout his life and even stood trial twice for the murder of a 17 year old girl um, and not many people still remember this case but her name was Helen um, her name was Helen her name was Helen Mary Harrelson and he the first time the jury could not come to a um, verdict and the second time he was acquitted because witnesses had died and evidence slowly um, disappeared and at the time of William's disappearance Frank was said to have been living rough near a timber yard at the time. So as I mentioned Frank Abbott he was living in the area at the time living rough in near the timber yard and yes yeah, many potential sightings of William have been reported over the years and sadly there have been no leads. The Buster family and the biological family want nothing more than to have William found and to be reunited with him. Um, William has sadly been missing for six years and just over three months and someone knows what happened to him, someone knows what happened that day, someone out there has a suspicion of someone in relation to William Terrell and no one has come forward. All it takes is one person coming forward to lead police in the right direction to find William Terrell to put the person behind bars to convict someone. That's all we need is one tip to lead police in the right direction and someone needs to come forward. Um, William Terrell is the first person in the state of New South Wales to have a million dollar reward offered or on offer for someone with information leading to William. Other states in Australia have had million dollar rewards before but this is the first time in New South Wales that a million dollar reward has been on offer. Um, if you want to find out more information about William, if you want to find out who to contact, if you want to share the website for William more, it is Where's William? Org and where's William is one word and people are strongly uh, to contact Crime Stoppers at 18 double zero triple three triple zero and this number will be put in the description bar down below and the website will be put in the description bar below. If you want to help out as much as you can share this video share any post of William, write a post and put the hashtag where's William one word. I put the hashtag in the title of this video and yeah that's all I can say at this point and I'm hoping that one day this gets solved and that he gets found and that's all any of us can hope for. Anyways, that is all for today's video. I hope you guys liked this one. I know it was very dark and sad because there's no justice, there's no reunited family, but it is important to talk about these cases. And yeah, I hope you guys liked it. If you do, hit that like and subscribe button, comment down below other cases you would like to see me cover. And remember, please share the video, please share any information on William that you can. And if you have any information, please contact Crime Stoppers at 18 double zero triple three triple zero or um, check out William, where's William org, one word, where's William. And also, if you're sharing anything about him, make sure to use the hashtag. Tag where's William. Anyways, I hope you guys like this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Disclaimer, I also highly recommend that you guys get this book. It has so much more information than what I can include in this video. I'm sure this video is already over half an hour long, but yeah. Missing William Terrell by Caroline Overington 
it's a really good book it has a lot of information and yeah i highly recommend it and it got so much more information than what i can include in this video and anyways with that um i hope you guys are seeing